Hello everybody, Harry from G-Man Ninja here and welcome back to our Quant series for the GRE. Now in this episode we're going to be taking a look at combinations and permutations. This is a big worry for lots of our students. First session when I ask people what kind of quant topics they struggle with, this is probably the number one topic, which is strange because it's really not going to make up that many of the questions you're going to see on the GRE and you're probably worrying about it a little bit too much. But at most, I'd guess you'd see three questions in the whole GRE exam, both quant sections, 40 questions, you're probably only going to see at most three questions on combinations and permutations. More likely it's going to be one or two. So if you're aiming for anything up to and including about a 160, then lots of this video is going to be complete overkill for you. Just probably suggest you stick around for the first two questions. We're going to go into the basics. We're going to take a look at does the order matter, which is going to be a big, a big part of deciding what to do in these questions. We'll go through the basic processes and then anything after that's probably overkill. For those of you aiming over 160, then we're going to get into the weird and wonderful questions that the GRE might ask about combinations of permutations. So what we'll cover in a bit more detail. Yeah, we'll take a look at does the order matter in the first couple of questions and dig into that basic process. Then we'll look at questions that ask you for at least one of something and how that changes the process. We'll look at questions that look like how many numbers, how many three digit numbers are even or something like that. Qu questions about the characteristics of numbers. And then we'll get into some words. How many different ways can you arrange these letters to create certain words? Finally, we're going to get into a couple of speculative questions. The GRE textbooks just don't have, and sorry, GRE textbooks and the practice exams just don't have that many questions on combinations of permutations, which is probably a sign of how infrequently they're going to show up on the exam. But we've done a bit of speculating about what the GRE could do. So for those of you that are really aiming for kind of 168, 169, 170, or for those of you that just aren't going to be comfortable unless you've turned over every single stone and studied every type of question, we've got a couple of questions at the end of this video that are going to get into that maybe area where the GRE might ask you something like this. So like I said, if you're aiming for anything up to a 160, stick around for the first couple of questions. Hopefully we'll have something for you there. After that, this is probably overkill for you. For those of you that are aiming for those very top scores, hopefully we'll have something that will challenge you a little later on in the video. So I've got seven questions for you today. I'll get the first one up on the screen and give you a couple of minutes to take a look at it, just like we do in every other video. Then I'll take the question away and we'll work through the solution together. So without any further ado, I'll get this first question up on the screen. I'll see you back here to look at the solution in a couple of minutes' time. Okay, as always with these videos, if you need a little more time to have a look at this question, now's your chance to pause the video. We'll still be here after you've finished working through the problem. Um, but for now, I'm going to take the question away so that we can work through the solution here together. All right, so 
as I said up in the intro, we're, we're looking at the basics here, basic processes. What what makes a uh, combinations question? What makes a permutations question? How can you tell the difference, and, and what should you do in each case? So first first clue we get in the, in the text of the question: How many different menus could she create? We're going to have different options here, a number of different options. So we know it's either going to be a combinations or a permutations question, and you've got to decide between the two. The big question, the first question you should ask as soon as you've identified I'm in that sort of combinations or permutations area, question to ask yourself is, does the order matter? So in this case, Sahira is going to eat the ice creams in the order she chooses them. So let's say she chooses vanilla, then chocolate, then strawberry, then mint chocolate chip. That order is going to be different than if she'd chosen strawberry, then chocolate, then vanilla, or if she'd chosen chocolate first, then vanilla, then mint chocolate, the order matters. Okay, and when the order matters, what I would do with this is to set out a series of slots, right? In this case, four slots, because she's going to choose, she's going to make four choices, all right? There is a formula for this, but there's also a formula for if the order does not matter. And I don't want you to have both of those formulas competing in your head. The, the scenario I always paint for my students is, imagine it's question 19 of the second GRE section. You're under a bit of time pressure. You're looking at a question and, and okay, you can decide here, the order matters. But because you're under pressure, your brain does funny things and it mixes up both of those formulas and you end up using the wrong one. If we separate out the two processes so that they are very different, it's much less likely you're going to mix up this formula with that formula. So what we normally suggest is when there is, when the order matters, I want you to use these slots. We'll go through the process. Then in the next question, we'll look at the, the different process, the, the use where I do want to use a formula. All right. So I've got four slots here. And the question, question we do with this is, how many options do I have for each slot? Okay, so Sahira's starting out. She's looking at the ice cream truck. We've got eight flavors to begin with. Her first choice, she's got eight flavors she can choose from. Then, second choice, okay, one of them's gone. She wants to choose, uh, wants to choose four of them to try. Um, she, they've got eight different flavors. She wants to try four different flavors. So what that one she's chosen is out of the picture. There are now seven to choose from. So we've got seven choices for that second one. Same process, the next choice she's gonna make, the first two are out of the picture. She can't choose those, but she's got to choose another one. So we've got six choices to choose from. Final one, five choices to choose from. So eight for the first choice, seven for the second, six for the third, five for the fourth. Now what we're looking at is what to do with these. And we end up multiplying these numbers together. Eight times seven times six times five. That's gonna give us our answer. That's gonna give us the number of menus. In combinations of permutations, the numbers can get pretty big, but thankfully GRE gives us a calculator. If you stick that into the calculator, 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, that'll give you 1,680. Coming over to the answer choices, that matches up with C, and so C is our answer here. All right, so as I said, first question, does the order matter? In this case, vanilla, then chocolate, then strawberry, then mint is different from chocolate, then strawberry, then vanilla, then mint chocolate chip. So the order definitely does matter. When the order matters, stick the slots in. How many options do you have for each slot? Multiply across that row and we get the answer to this question. That's the first type of question the GRE might ask you on combinations of permutations. We've got a permutations question. All right, I'm going to get the next question up on the screen, give you a couple of minutes. As I said, ask yourself, does the order matter? That's the big first question, and I'll see you back here to take a look at the next one very soon.
Okay, pause now if you want some more time to take a look at this one, but I'm going to take the question away so that we can get to a solution here. All right, so similar question, similar setup, how many different combinations? So I know I'm in that combinations and permutation space that we're talking about in this video, but this time, ask yourself that first question, does the order matter? All Ralph is going to do here is choose two different flavors of ice cream and two different drinks. There's no indication that there's any order to this. There's no indication that the drinks come first or that one type of drink comes before the other. This is just six different flavors of ice cream, eight different types of drink. Choose two ice creams, two, choose two drinks. That's it. All right, so I'm going to separate this out. I'm going to look at the, uh, let's look at the ice cream first. Ignore the drinks for now. We're just going to look at the ice cream. That's an extra bit of difficulty. I'm going to separate this problem out a little bit. I want to choose two ice cream flavors from the six available. Now, like we said in the last question, when the order matches, put the slots in and just add in how many options are available for each slot. When the order does not matter, I'd love to have a way that does this without a formula, but I can't think of one. And so we're going to have to go for a formula here. And so what I'd say, the formula we're going to give you is if I want to I want to choose our options from a group of n. In this case, it's going to be two options from a group of six, but our options from a group of n, then the formula, the way you might see it written is n with a big C and then an R. And then it's going to be n factorial over r factorial n minus r factorial. Now, don't worry if you're looking at it going, what on earth are those exclamation marks doing in there? We're going to go through that in just a second. That's the structure of the formula. That's the bit that, unfortunately, you're going to have to memorize here. Now, what we can do in this question is to begin putting numbers in. So I've got six different flavors of ice cream, and I need to choose two. So as I said, my n is going to be six, and my r is going to be two. So for the ice cream, we could say that this is going to be six choose two, which means 6 factorial over 2 factorial, 6 minus 2 factorial. All right, 6 factorial on the top. That exclamation mark means I start from 6 and multiply down all the numbers until I get to 1. So 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The 2 factorial does the same thing. That's 2 times 1. And then the 6 minus 2, within the parentheses, 6 minus 2 will give me 4. I've got the exclamation mark on the outside, so I've got 4 factorial there, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Now, this might look great, big, nasty, lots of numbers in there, lots of multiplication. Things can get very big very quickly, but you also get lots of cancelling here. So I've got a 4 on top and bottom, I've got a 3, I've got a 2, I've got a 1. So all of that can cancel. Then I can, I've got a 6 and a 5 on the top and a 2 on the bottom. So I can cancel the 2 with a 6. This whole thing cancels down to 3 times 5, which gives you 15. So thankfully, the GRE gives you a calculator. So it's, yeah, it's not intimidating to deal with large numbers. But a lot of the times, these things are going to cancel down very quickly. And you end up with something reasonably manageable. So I've got 15 different ways I can choose two flavors of ice cream from the six available. All right. Now, separately, let's go look at the number of ways of finding the, the number of drinks that Ralph can choose from. Very similar setup, eight types of drink, two choices to make. So I'd use eight, choose two. So that's eight factorial over two factorial, um, eight minus two factorial. Because I've done it here, I'm going to jump a few steps in this. That thing will cancel down to 8 times 7 over 2, which would leave me with 4 times 7, and so 28. All right. If that was a bit quick, feel free to pause the video here and just go work that through in the same way. It does all cancel down to 8 times 7 times 2, which will give you 28. All right, so I've got the number of ways of choosing number of ice cream flavors Ralph could choose from, number of ways of choosing number of drinks Ralph could uh, choose from. That each of those individually might be a question in themselves. That Yeah, this 15 could be an answer to a question, but we've added an extra layer in here. Ralph's choosing both the ice cream and a, a couple of drinks here. So with two ice creams, two drinks, how many different ways of choosing them both? And the way to figure this out, so that there's a, a way of using the words or and the words and. If I'm choosing two drinks and two ice creams, as we're doing here, then I'm going to multiply between them. 
So the word and you can think about as multiplying. If it was two ice creams or two drinks, then I would put an add sign in the middle and it would be 15 plus 28. So if you can, you can sort of substitute the word and that equals multiply the word or you can think of that as being addition. And that gives you a way of combining these groups. It gives you a way of shorthanding it. I want the number of ice creams and the number of drinks. So I'm going to use the multiply. So our final answer for this question is going to be the 15 number of different ways of choosing the ice cream multiplied by the 28, the number of ways of choosing the uh, the drinks, which if you chuck that in your calculator, that would give you 420. And so the answer to this question is going to be B. So that was a, that was a pretty big question. There was a, a probably a little bit more to that than it might be in just your standard. Uh, this would be a combinations question. As I said, the question might just be this bit. It might just be the number of ice creams. But with what we've done here is we've put together, find the number of ways to do two groups, and then how you could combine those groups into, into kind of different scenarios the question might give you. All right, as I said up at the start of the video, if you're aiming for anything up to a 160, that's probably all you need. Yeah, you might see two, as I said, maybe three combinations or permutations questions in the whole of the exam. And if you can answer one of them using the, the stuff that we've done so far, you're probably going to be absolutely fine. For those of you that are really going for 160 plan, I'm really talking sort of a higher end of that 163 up, I'd say. Stick around. We're going to have some challenging questions for you coming up. Um, I'll get the next one up on the screen. We're looking for the different variations, the ways the GRE can take what we've done so far and twist and turn it in the question. So I'll get the next one up on the screen, give you a couple of minutes to take a look at it, and I'll see you back here soon. Okay, pause now if you want a bit more time to take a look at this question um, before we take that one away. All right, I've said it before, but I'm just going to repeat it here. If you're aiming for anything up to a 160, anything from here on out in this video is probably overkill. Right? If you want to make sure you've turned over every rock, looked at everything, then fine, stick around with us. But you're probably not going to need this to get anything up to a 160, even 161, 162. This is still probably overkill. We're really stretching up into the high 160s with the kind of content you need here. All right, having said that, let's go through that list of questions just to make sure we know which path we're following as we go through this. So the first bit to notice in the question, how many teams? Now, I know this is the combinations of permutations video, so you know what kind of topic we're looking at, but that's the clue I'm looking for in the question that says, right, combinations or permutations, I know which topic area I'm in. Next bit we need to look at is, well, does the order matter? So if we look at the teams we're choosing here, if I choose 
engineer number one first, engineer number two second, engineer number three third. Does that make a different group from choosing engineer three first, two second, and then one first? The answer in this case would be no. As long as I've got those three people together in a group, that counts as one. It doesn't matter whether I choose one, then two, then three, or three, then two, then one. They're still going to be in the team. So the order does not matter. We're going to be using the formula, not the slots. All right. The next bit we're looking at, and that's what this question is, is built on, is I've got this at least one here. So I'm not just looking for the number of ways of doing a certain group, because at least one engineer, I could have one engineer and three salespeople, or I could have two engineers and two salespeople, or I could have three engineers and one salesperson. I can't have four engineers, but only because I've only got three engineers to choose from. Yeah, if I had more engineers, then maybe I could look at the four engineers and zero salespeople group, but, but not in this case, not in this question. But what that means is if I went down that path and found the number of ways of putting one engineer and three salespeople and two engineers and two, I've got a lot of work to do. That's going to take a, an awfully long time. All right. So as an alternative, what I could do is say, well, just what are the number of ways of choosing how many groups of four can I get from this seven person department? All right, so I've got seven people in the department, just how many teams of four could I make? And then take away the number of teams that would include zero engineers. So kind of the, the rather than doing three different options and then adding up the different ways, why don't I just do one, one option? And so what that would look like would be, well, how many ways are there of choosing just a team of four from the seven that are available. So choosing four from seven, that would be seven, choose four, back to that formula, seven factorial over four factorial, seven minus four factorial. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here, but if you want to pause the video here and work this out, feel free, go for it. That's gonna cancel down to um, seven times six times five over three times two times one. Those three in the bottom cancel with the six and we end up with 35. So seven, choose four. The number of ways of choosing any four people, doesn't matter whether they're engineers or salespeople, the number of ways of choosing any four people from this department is 35, all right? Now, the bit that I need to subtract from that is what are the number of ways of choosing a team where there are no engineers in them whatsoever? So if I remove all the engineers, get rid of those, then there's only four salespeople in the department. I need to choose a team of four from the four salespeople in the department. So this time I'm choosing the team of four from only the four salespeople. Well, four choose four. Again, we can go through the formula here. That would be four factorial over four factorial, four minus four factorial, right? Just as a bit of a definition thing, four, four minus four turns out to be zero. Zero factorial for reasons we really don't need to get into this video. Zero factorial comes out to be one. So the four factorial cancels with the four factorial. That's just one. The whole thing turns out to be one. And if you think about that, there is only one way of choosing four people from a group of four. I just take everybody. All right. So yes, it works out algebraically, but you can think about that one just logically if, if, you, can, if you can go with that. I've got to choose four from a group of four. Well, I just take everybody. There's only one way of doing it. Everybody's in. So there are 35 ways of just choosing a team of four from the entire department without any restrictions whatsoever. There is one way of making a team from the department with no engineers in. So there must be 35 minus one or 34 ways of choosing a team from this department that includes at least one engineer. And so the answer to this question is going to be D. All right. Now, if you want to, feel free to pause the video here and go and work out each of these separately. And you'll you'll find that it should add up to 34 again, because the, the route you take through this problem doesn't particularly matter. I just think this way where I have to figure out two different groups and one of them is quite easy is far simpler than working out six different groups and figuring out how to combine them to get the final answer here that's going to be 34. All right, so when, yeah, when you've got this at least one in it, you can hopefully make it a bit easier by doing taking going the other way. How many ways could I choose the group from everybody and then take away the number of ways of choosing the group, choosing a group with zero of the thing you want.
All right, so that's that's one of the ways the GRE could take this combinations material, make it a bit more difficult. Again, we're going to twist, keep twisting and turning the questions. Now, get a slightly different option up on the screen for you. Give you another couple of minutes, and we'll see you back here to take a look at the solution soon. Okay, I hope that's been enough time to take a look at this problem. I'm going to take this one away so that we can work through the solution here. All right, this time we're looking at looking at numbers, three-digit integers, and I want to know how many of them are, well, how many greater than 799 are both odd and have no repeated digits in here. So 799 and below is out. It's 800 up to 999. That's the list of numbers I'm looking for. Now, in this case, again, first question for one of these questions, does the order matter? Well, in this case, yes, because... 801 is different from 810. They're just, they're completely different numbers. Um, so yes, the order matters. And this time I'm going to have to work with, the, work with the slots. So I'm going to, I'm going to put those in. Now I'm going to do two different routes here. One for numbers in the 800s and one for numbers in the 900s. You have to bear with me for a second. I will explain the reason for that, but give me a bit of a bit of time to get into the, the why because it comes a little further down the line. All right, so when, when you're in a question like this, what, what I would aim to do is to move from the most restricted slot to the least restricted slot. All right. Again, let me follow this through and you'll hopefully see what that means as we as we work through the problem. So in these numbers, the first one, well, I've said here that these numbers are all in the 800s. So in this case, there is only one number that can go in the first, first number here. It has to be an eight. It's 800 and something. And similarly, in this second one, I'm in the 900s. There's only one option I can put in there. So it has to go in that that has to be a one. It's in the 900s. All right. Now, if we're moving from most restricted to least restricted, the next place I'm going to look is going to be this last digit, because I know this number or these numbers have to be odd. All right. So I've got a big restriction on this last digit that I don't have on the middle digit. So I'm going to go from the first one, most restricted, to the next most restricted. All right. Now, if I look at the 800s first, I can't repeat a number. This has been an even digit, so I could have one, three, five, seven, or nine as the final digit. I could have any of five numbers, so I've got five options there. If I'm looking at the 900s, I've already used a nine, so I can't use another nine at the end. So I could put a one, a three, a five, or a seven there, but I can't put a nine, so I've only got four options for that final digit. And that was why I separated out the 800s and the 900s, because these, num these numbers, these final options would be different. All right, now we're moving from most restricted to least restricted. We've only got one option left, All right? In this top one, I've used an eight. I've used an odd number. Don't know what it is, but I know I've used an odd number. Of the digits I've got left, well, from zero, one, two, three, from zero to nine, there are 10 digits. I've used two of them. I have eight left, so I can put an eight in there. 
exactly the same way down the bottom. Okay, this time I've used two odd numbers, but it still means I've got eight digits left that I can put in this middle place. Okay. So now, if, as I work along the line, I'm going to multiply. Again, because I, I can think about this as a first digit, that would be an eight, and whatever is in the second digit, and whatever is in that third digit. So when you use the word and, multiply. So 1 times 8 times 5, there are going to be 40 numbers in the 800s that satisfy the conditions we've been given. Exactly the same down below. Uh, there's going to be one option, eight options, four options. I've got some number and another number and another number. So multiply across, that's going to give me 32. Right, so I've got 40 in the 800s, 32 in the 900s. And now it's a case of, because the number could either be in the 800s or in the 900s, doesn't really matter which, 800s or 900s, because I use the word or, I'm going to add those two options together, and so my final answer here is going to be 72, which gives me the answer of C. All right, so that, that way of doing it, of um, saying, well, yes, the order matters, so I'm going to use the slots, and then moving from most restricted to least restricted. So I didn't just move left to right as I worked along these. That's, that's the way that I go about dealing with the numbers questions. Um, as I say, I couldn't explain at the time why I split it to 800s and 900s, but I hope that you saw that by the time we got to the odd digit at the end, the fact that 800 was even and 900, sorry, 8 was an even number starting it and 9 was an odd number starting each of these numbers made for a different scenario. And that's why I split the 800 and the 900 there. Hopefully that bit at the end about and means multiply or means add is making a bit more sense now that you've seen a few options and we're beginning to get through these. All right, so th there's, there's a number option. There's the, the ways of combining the numbers. Again, I've got one more question that we're definitely sure we've seen in plenty of GRE questions. This is the sort of thing you might see in an exam. Um, I'll get it up on the screen. Give me a couple of minutes. We'll see you back here to take a look at the solution soon. All right, pause this here if you want some more time to take a look at this problem. Um, all right, this one's quite a lot like that third problem we looked at, the at least one question. But this time, it's slightly different. At least, at least two. Yeah, we've got the at least in there, but at least two. Okay, so that last question, the, the, sorry, the question three that we looked at, yeah, there was a definite time saving in seeing how many groups, just how many groups in total, and then taking away the, the number of groups where there were zero engineers in that question. We were looking at engineers and sales personnel. In this question, that time saving by going down that sort of go the other way route, that time saving doesn't really exist here. Ah, there's maybe a slight change, but in this question, I'd probably just sort of say, right, suck it up. I'm going to be here for some time. Let's just be systematic with a calculation and see how see how smooth I can make this. So in this problem, we know we have five that, five trucks that have a long wheelbase and four that have a short wheelbase. And I want to choose a group. The group has to be 
four, four vans. That's what I'm, that's what I'm choosing here. All right. How many selections of four vans where at least two have a long wheelbase? So I could have two with a long wheelbase and two with a short, or I could have um, two with a long, sorry, two with a long and two with a short, or I could have three with a long wheelbase and one with a short, or I could have four with a long wheelbase and zero with a short wheelbase. And now I've just got to keep my head, stay nice and calm, and just work through the calculations here smoothly as, as sensibly as possible. All right, so this question, the order doesn't matter. doesn't matter whether I choose this truck before that truck because I just get, I get my group at the end anyway. The order of these doesn't matter at all, so I'm going to be using the formula. I've got, for this first one, I've got five long wheelbases to choose from, and I need to choose two. So that's going to be five choose two of them and then i've got four short and i want to choose two so we're going to have four choose two because i've got the and in between them i would multiply the outcome of those together and that's going to give us our answer so five choose two i'm going to skip a few steps in this again if you want to have the practice of the calculation feel free to pause the video here and catch back up to this but five choose two if you work through that that's going to give uh 10 options and four choose two would give six and so that's going to give us a total of 60 there now it's just a case of keep doing the same thing as you work through the the other the other groups i've got five long wheelbases to choose from and i want to choose three in the second group and then for the short ones i've got four to choose from and i want to choose one five choose three if you go and work that out that'll give you 10 four choose one is going to be four and so sorry four times 10 there is going to give us 40. And then finally, I've got four long wheelbases and zero short to choose from. And so I would need to do five, choose four. If I'm choosing four long ones out of the group of five, multiply that by four, choose zero. All right, so five, choose four. There is uh, five ways of doing that. Four, choose zero. Yeah, there's only one way of not choosing any from the group of four. I just, I don't choose any. So we get five times one there, which gives us five. Because these are ors between them, so I can choose two long and two short, or three long and one short. When I use the word or, I'm going to think about adding. So 60 plus 40 plus five gives me a final answer here of 105. And so the answer to this question is going to be D. All right, if you want to pause the video here and give the other route a try where you do nine choose four to figure out the total number of groups and then take away the number of groups where there are zero long wheelbases or one wheelbase, fine, go for it. The, the time saving in this question is minimal. You're probably going to be calculating for quite a while anyway. Like I said, I would read this question and just sort of sigh a little bit and just go, right, I'm just going to have to suck it up. I'm going to have to do some calculating here. Keep it neat, keep it tidy, make sure it's systematic, work through the problem. And as I hope you see getting to that final answer, once you've done a bit of practice on how to get through these choose formulas relatively quickly, getting to the final answer actually doesn't take that long as long as you're careful with the setup and define what you're looking for before you just jump into calculating. All right, so that is the end of the questions for which we are really confident the GRE is going to or could ask something about it. What we've done now for the final two questions of the video, we've got a bit speculative. We've looked through the textbooks, we've looked through the practice exams, and we've sort of gone for, hey, they've, they've asked this question once, they might ask it again. So Freya, from here on out, I can't promise you that this will be on the GRE really, but it might be. We're speculating a little bit and like I said before, if you're really looking for those very top 167, 68, 69, 170 scores on the quant section, and you want to make sure you haven't left any stone unturned, then stick around. Hopefully, we've got a couple of slightly challenging ones coming up for you now. So I'll get the first of those two up on the screen. Um, we'll give you a couple of minutes. And I'll see you back here to have a look at the solution.
Okay, pause here if you want a bit more time to take a look at this one. Um, all right, as, as we said, there is only one example of a question like this in either the practice exams or the textbook. So we're reaching a bit here, but there's a lot in this question that if you're aiming for those really top level scores that hopefully you'll get out of this and we can generalize out from this. And if you get asked a question like this in your exam, you're able to cover it. So the big difference this time, I've been given the answer. Up until now, we've always said how many groups, how many teams, how many combinations. This time, we know there's 700. The thing that we're looking for is to work backwards. How many books? Um, so what we'll do here is we'll, we'll look at the scenario, we'll set up an equation that we can use, and then it's about solving that equation and how, how this question changes. So in this scenario, this bibliophile, this woman, she wants to buy a certain number of books. She's got seven hardback books to choose from, and she wants to choose four of them. And then we've got this unknown number of softback books, and she wants to choose three of them. So let's deal with the hardback books first. Does, first question, does the order matter? If she buys book one, two, three, four, is that a different group than if she chose book four, three, two, one? And in this case, doesn't matter. They're still the same four books. So we're using the formula in this case. We're not using the slots. I'm just choosing four hardback books out of the group of seven. So seven hardback books to choose from. She's going to choose four of them. Very similar way, I have an unknown number of softback books. So let me call that S. And she's going to choose three of them. So number of hardback books, number of softback books. Now, to, for what goes in the middle, again, we go back to that, um, if and means multiply and or means add. So this woman's going to choose four hardback books and three softback books. So I'm going to use multiply, put a little multiply sign in the middle of that, and we know the total. We know that's going to add up to 700. And now this question is a case of let's work through the algebra here to in order to get an answer and find this unknown value here. So first job, let's figure out what 7 choose 4 is. So throwing this into the formula, that's going to be 7 factorial over 4 factorial, 7 minus 4 factorial, and nothing else changes at the moment. Cancelling this down, uh, we would get, cancelling the 7 factorial with the 4 factorial, we're going to get 7 times 6 times 5. 7 minus 4 is 3, so 3 factorial, 3 times 2 times 1. I've still got everything else here. Bottom line, 3 times 2 times 1 cancels with the 6. 7 times 5 gives me 35. And then dividing both sides by 35, I get S choose 3 is equal to 20. All right, so at this stage, things are going to get a little bit different now because I've got one of these choose functions with the algebra in it. All I'm going to do to begin with is throw it back into the formula that we've just been using. So what I'd get there is S factorial over 3 factorial s minus 3 factorial, and that whole thing equals 20. All right, if you know where this is going now, fantastic. We can jump and get to an answer relatively smoothly. But for those of you that aren't that comfortable with what we're doing now with algebra, with the the um, the, the exclamation mark, the um, I've completely forgotten what that word is, um, with the exclamation mark here, um, then I'm going to do this out in a bit more detail so that you can see what's going on. So that top line there, I don't know what the number s is, but what I can say about what's going on here is that's the same as saying s times s minus 1 times s minus 2 times s minus 3. If there's an s minus 4 in there, great, all the way down to 1. I don't know how long it'll take me to get down to 1, but I would go all the way to 1. I'm going to leave the 3 factorial in there. Now s minus 3 factorial, that's the word I've forgotten, factorial, those exclamation marks. Again, s minus 3, s minus 4, all the way down to 1. All right. Now, I've because I've got s minus 3, s minus 4, it would go on s minus 5, s minus 6 on the top line. And I've got s minus 3, s minus 4, s minus 5 on the bottom line. These start to cancel each other out. And I would continue cancelling until I got all the way down to 1. So what I'm left with on the top line is s times s minus 1 times s minus 2. On the bottom line, I've got 3 factorial. That's just 6. And that all equals 20. All right, multiplying both sides by 6, I get s times s minus 1 times s minus 2. The whole thing equals 120. Okay, we've got two choices here. What we could do is we could multiply all this out, simplify it down, get ourselves a, a nice cubic equation, go and factorize as much as we can and get to an answer. But that's probably going to take quite a while. We've done quite a lot of work already, and the algebra could get a bit nasty there. The alternative is to say, look, I've got three numbers multiplied together. 
they're consecutive numbers, S, S minus 1, S minus 2, and I'm going to get 120. Why don't I go take a look at the answer choices? Because they're all very close to each other, they're all integers, and I'll see what I can do. So what I would do at this point is go right for the middle one, because I'm going to know whether to go up or whether to go down. So I'm going to go for the middle one. If S is 7, which is the number of softback books, that's what we're looking for, then 7 would go for S times 6 times 5. 7 times 6 times 5, that's going to be 210. That's too big. So I'm going to go up. The answer is either going to be A or B. Next one, if I check out B, well, if S is 6, I've got 6 times 5 times 4. That equals 120, which is exactly what I wanted. So we can say S there, S is equal to 6. And the answer to this question is going to be B. All right, so yeah, there's a lot going on here. This is going to be up right at the top end of the difficulty scale that the GRE is going to throw at you. I've probably written out a bit more algebra than you would need to if you're going to be comfortable with answering this question, but I want to make sure that everybody following knows where they're going with it. Hopefully you could follow that process. Like I say, we're looking for, we're working backwards. We were given the answer and looking for that unknown. And this is what happens when you get into those factorial type um, equations involving the algebra there. Stuff does cancel in just the same way it does when you're dealing with numbers. All right, I've got one more question for you today. Um, again, we're, we're reaching here. There is one example of this question in either the textbook or the exam, so you might not need this, but we're going to try and cover every base with all this combination of permutations material. For the last time today, I'll get this up on the screen, give you a couple of minutes to take a look at it, and I'll see you back here to work through the solution very soon. Okay, for the final time today, if you need a bit more time to think about this question, now's your chance to pause the video, but I'm going to take this question away so we can take a look at it. All right, big, big, big caveat here of the four or 500 questions that you can see in the practice exams, the big textbook, or the quant review, there's only one that looks like this. So if this is intimidating, I'm not surprised. We've changed the notation entirely. We've involved probability. There's a lot more going on here, but the chances of this being asked are very slim. If you're aiming for anything up to, I mean, even 165, 166, you're probably absolutely fine without needing this question. It's only for those of you who are right up at the top end, the 168, 169, 170, you need to get everything right that I would really worry about this problem. All right, but let's go into it. Let's see how we can get to an answer here. So first job, let's deal with the changes in notation here because that, that's going to make a big difference to how easily this question is to understand. So what we've got here, like 30 and 3 in a set of parentheses, one on top of the other, no line between them. What that means, that's just another way of writing the choose function we've been dealing with so far. So this 30 over 3, if we go back to the n's and the r's we used in the formula, n over r is the same as n choose r. 
And so this, we've just flipped the notation. Nothing more, nothing has changed. It does exactly the same job. This is just that choose function we've been using throughout the video. Now that, that maybe gives you a hint as wh where this question is going. The order to this choice doesn't matter. I d it doesn't matter which order I choose the people with the peanut allergy or the people without the peanut allergy. I just need to choose them. So in, in none of the answer choices does the order matter. We don't have to worry about that. The next thing that might be sort of getting in the way of understanding this question is, is this factor of the probability. What's the probability of selecting? And that's where these fractions come in. So you could think about the probability of of an event is the number of ways of that event happening divided by the total number of things that could happen. So we might have a couple of calculations to do, but two separate ideas here. Top line, I've got the number of ways of this event happening. I've got the number of ways of this thing that I want to happen. How does that happen? How many ways could that happen? And the bottom line of this probability is just the total number of things that could happen. So let's deal with this top line first. The scenario I've got here is I've got 30 people, five of them have a nut allergy. I want to choose three people of those three exactly two of them are going to have the allergy and one of them is not. So for the people that have the nut allergy, I've got five people to choose from. Five people have the allergy. I need to choose exactly two of them. Doesn't matter the order. And so if we go back to what we've been doing so far in this video, I'd say that's five, choose two. I've got five people to choose from. Five people have the nut allergy and I need to choose exactly two of those people to go into this group. All right. In order for that to work, I've got a group of three. I've chosen two of them. I still have one more. I need to choose one more person to go in. For it to be exactly two people having the nut allergy, this third person needs to not have the nut allergy. Okay. If five people out of the group of the 30 have the allergy, then 25 people do not have the allergy, and I need to choose one person from that group. So choosing that, that'd be 25 choose one. Now, the combination here, again, think back to and means multiply or means add. I need to choose two people with a nut allergy and one person without the nut allergy. I've used the word and. I'm going to stick the multiply sign in the middle there. Right, that would be the top line, of our, um, top line of our fraction for our probability. The bottom line, I need to know the total number of things that could happen. Right, so if we look at the scenario that we were given and strip out the idea of people with an allergy or people without an allergy, all I've got here is 30 people in total, and I'm choosing a group of three. And so the number of ways, the uh, total number of things that could happen would be 30, and I'm choosing three of them. 30 people in total, I choose three of them. All right. Now, that, that's the way that we've been setting up these scenarios as we go through this, this, this video. What we need to do now in order to match the answer choices is to flip that notation so it looks more like the answer choices we're, we're working with here. So five choose two, that just becomes a five and a two in a set of parentheses. 25 choose one, 25 and a one. And on the bottom of this fraction, 30 and a three. And the job now is just to go and match these up to one of the answer choices. And if you do that, you'll see that D looks exactly the same. It is, it is the same as the scenario we've set up. And so D is going to be the answer to this question. So just to repeat that big caveat I put up at the start of this question, because there could be some things in here that are worrying you. Of the four or 500 questions the GRE has published, the official stuff, both of these bits really only comes up in one question. So if, you, if you're aiming for anything, anything at all up to 165, please don't worry about what's going on here. This is really for those of you who are right up at the top end of the, the, the score scale and you really can't leave any stone unturned. You need to know everything in order to make sure the GRE couldn't ask you any question. The chances of you being asked a question like this are very slim, but it could happen. So hopefully that's covered all the bases. And if you understand what's gone on there, you're pretty much covered for anything the GRE could throw at you. All right. That's all I've got for you today. I hope that's been helpful. Um, thank you very much for watching, everybody, and we hope to see you back here at another one of our videos very soon. Have a great day.